Support by the Hope Network Center for Autism. You can join us and be part of a mission that takes on the challenges, the barriers, the statistics, the seemingly impossible, and help us overcome them all. HopeNetwork.org slash autism. Do you know what, how long have you been here in the scrubs now? Uh, 12 hours. Uh, 24 hours. I arrived at 10, quarter 12 yesterday. What's your reaction to the place? Well, it's, been, it's the best prison I've been in so far. It's uh, more easy going than anywhere else. I mean, in Birmingham, places like that, you're locked up 23 hours a day, but you've been out all day. And last night I was downstairs playing snooker and things like that. It's quite good. Don't feel too bad. No, I'm not too worried, really. It's, uh, like I say, it's not a lot, bit, a lot different than being in the army. Uh, the pay's not so good and the leave is absolutely lousy, but it's easy enough. How long since you been given a life sentence? Uh, well, it's, it was two weeks ago Friday, so... Uh, there's only another ooh, 14 years and 50 weeks ago. Number 84. Okay. So why are you actually here? What actually happened? Well, I'm here for murder, but uh, I think there's been a mistake made myself. But uh, it was a silly situation. It was my father that I'm accused of murdering. Uh, well, my stepfather, but to me, he was my father. Once you're here, you will have a, a personal case officer. He will make himself known to you. Now, it's also up to you to make yourself known to him. Get to know him, talk to him, and as I say, if you have any problems, sort them out with Mr. Maxwell. He will be writing your reports for your boards when they come up. And from these reports, it all depends how, you know, how long you do. You've got your sentence to do, right? You've got a life sentence in front of you. It, I can't say how long it is it's going to be, but you work this out. And all, a lot of it depends virtually on your behaviour inside, uh, how you go about your sentence and your training as such, OK? If you are prepared to behave yourself, keep your nose clean, get on with your training, you'll be treated as such, like, you know? But if you want to make a nuisance of yourself or get into a lot of trouble and bother, which some of them do, you will be treated accordingly, okay? I feel the easy way. Well, this is it. It's fine. This is how we prefer it. You know, we prefer it that way as well. It's it's down to you. Like, you know, you've got your sentence to do. How you do it is entirely up to you, okay? We had a dinner party for Zoom. My, my family, like the four of us, my grandparents and two family friends, there were only the eight of us there. And we had a, a nice dinner and quite a lot to drink. And the party broke up about midnight, I suppose. And me and my dad stayed downstairs talking. Initially discussing me leaving the army, which is what I was planning on doing. Because I'd had four years of it not getting very far. So I thought I was going to come out and see what I could do. You know, in the business world or whatever, you know. Anyway, about four o'clock in the morning, we were pretty well drunk, right? And we've always got on good together, me and my dad, you know, we're really, really close. But we're all sort of taking the mickey out of each other, like, you know, like you do. 
And then he turned around and said, oh, well, I'm a lot better with a shotgun than you are. Like, and I said, no, don't be silly, you know. I'm a soldier, of course I'm good with a gun. Got to be, you know. He said, well, go on, prove it then, you know. I said, well, how are we going to prove it? He said, well, go and get a couple of shotguns. So we both got shotguns. So I went upstairs and got two shotguns and we had a, a live cartridge each. And the idea of the game was, and it was a game, the idea of the game was to see who could load the shotgun, make it ready for firing the fastest. Well, I beat him, you see, and I said, oh, that's it. You see, you've lost. So she said, well, go on, and I dare you to pull the trigger. I thought, well, fair enough, pull, pull the trigger. So I pulled the trigger, bang. But I didn't know at the time the gun was pointing at him, and it hit him in the side of the head. Which, uh, it made rather a mess. Um, well, I just threw my gun away, and I went and phoned the police and waited for them to get there. Like, and they took me down the station and arrested me. I don't really remember a lot about what happened. It was just that, uh, I mean, I'm only going by what was said at the time and what the evidence was, because I've got no memory of it at all myself, and total amnesia. With a mixture of drink and a shock, I suppose. But uh, when I went up for trial, the jury found me guilty of murder. So, hence, I'm doing life. It's quite difficult trying to live without him, too, because, you know, I mean, I mean he meant everything to me. I mean, I've got no one to run to now if I've got a problem. It's, uh, I never got problems, I always went home and spoke to my dad. And I never made a decision until I spoke to him either. Which is why I was speaking to him about leaving the army, which is... Now I've got, I've got to do things on my own. I mean, I still with my mum and my sister, but... Uh, he was really so much special. <sighs> but do you think your discipline in army life is enabling you now to come to terms oh, with yeah. a life sentence. Yeah, it's certainly helping. That, that's what's holding you together because you seem very unemotional about it, restrained and controlled. No reason why you should be emotional. But, uh... Well, there is, I mean, okay, I could be, I could be cracking up, um, throwing a panic, but the way I was trained, if you, you don't panic when when things are when things are a bit sticky because if you panic you're going to get into more trouble. So if I just remain cool and do as I'm told, be polite, I'll get on, I'll get by. And then come the end of it, I can walk about, walk away, and say, well, I did all right there. I kept my head and I'm okay. But uh, nobody's going to benefit if I start causing trouble or throwing a panic. So it's. Just questions, sit back and wait for the end. But if your appeal fails, you could face some considerable years in prison as a very oh, young man. Oh, certainly. But then there's a bright side to it. I am a young man, and I'll still be a young man when I get out. It's a bright side to everything. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm 23 now. If I do eight years, I'll be uh, 31. Still a young man. So there's just no problem. I mean, it's a problem being locked up, sure, but I can handle it. There's 300 people in here handling it every day, so if they can do it, I can do it. D-wing Wormwood Scrubs. This is where men in the south of England usually begin a life sentence. Three quarters of them have been convicted of murder. They stay between three to five years before allocation to another jail. Everything a lifer does in the wing, whom he associates with, whether he conforms to the rules, how he responds to life in prison, is observed, assessed and reported on by the staff. A life sentence is significantly different from any other sentence. It is indeterminate. This means that a lifer has no release date to look forward to, no fixed set number of years to be served in prison, no light at the end of the tunnel until the parole board and the Home Secretary decide on freedom. And then it is a special kind of freedom for when and if a lifer is eventually released, he is on license literally for the rest of his life. Good afternoon. Come on. 
Take a seat, please. <clears throat> OK. Well, first of this is a long-term training board where work, education, prison discipline, all aspects of a lifer's existence are discussed, including his sentence. A governor and other members of prison staff attach particular importance to a man's attitude towards his crime, especially to whether he acknowledges his guilt and shows remorse. In Jimmy's case, the murder of an old-age pensioner whilst robbing his house. This is your first of three boards that you'll have at Wormwood Scrubs, this being our six months after your reception, your next one will be in a year's time. And then the final one, the timing of that will be determined to a very large extent by the Home Office themselves. And that when they call for final reports, we will do your final board. But you'll be given due notice of that. Yeah. All right? I'll pull no punches with you. Um, do you appreciate the less people are convinced over a period of time that you really have got the strength of personality to try and overcome this drink problem? bearing in mind what's happened as a result of your drinking problem. Somebody lost their life. Yeah, correct, yeah. But they're going to look very, very seriously indeed at any question of you being released back into society. Yeah. You appreciate that? I do, yeah. Does your wife appreciate yeah. it? Yeah. And you say you really genuinely want to overcome it? Genuinely, yes, sir. What have you done about it inside? I first saw the doctor when I first came in, and I was getting help in Brixton from uh, Barbara. I can't remember her name. She was a probation officer. She was talking to me every day. And I saw the PMO when I first came in, and I put down to see the city alcoholic doctor mm -hmm. and the psychiatrist, and it was, I think, four months. And I've just started seeing Dr. Margio now. But I've tried, like, every time I've been down at the location to see him. Yes. And eventually I got to see him. Yes. And now he's dealing with me at the moment. Yes. I see. With regard to getting on with people, I must say your reports are very good indeed. That. Okay. Uh, it's well documented by all that you have no difficulty in mixing either with your fellow prisoners or with staff. Um, it strikes me that you're accepting the sentence and doing it in a remarkably calm and easy way. Do you think the shock and the implication of what it means has yet settled upon your shoulders? No, I don't think so, no. As I said to you at the beginning, I don't know why I'm doing the sentence. I know I've got to be punished because I was there, but I don't know what I've done. You accept that you were there and that a man died. Yeah. Do you think it's right that you should be doing a life sentence? Yes, I do, yeah. I was completely implicated with it, you know. It's just the murder tag. Yeah. And the fact that the judge recommended that you've got to do 15, 15 years. years. Yeah. This is the first time lifers have ever been permitted to speak freely on camera, and the first time filming has been allowed here since the riot of 1979 but we were not allowed to film particularly notorious lifers or terrorists. Such men live here along with other categories of prisoner, including occasional short-termers. Because of this mix, the regime in D-Wing is strict. It is slowly being relaxed, but prisoners cannot meet freely on the landings or in the cells. The lack of association causes bitterness. Well, it comes in was easy in 64, and then we're in 82 now. It's got harder then. Well, you were, still, you were still swapping out in 64, weren't you? Yeah, but it was easier in 64. Yeah, but that was because all the doors were open in the morning and then left all day, weren't they? But you had uh, the, the kind of people you had in here then was more harder then than what you got in here now. Yes, but it's because of problems that have happened during that period that it's been necessary to tighten things up. Yeah, but if you're talking about the riot, we're paying for the riot in 79. I wasn't here even 79. So, all the blokes who was here in 79 in a riot, right, they're all gone. Is that right or wrong? Most of them have, yes. Right? Yeah. So we're paying for the 79 riot? You could say that, yes. Yeah. So we're paying you for could the say that. You could say that, but at the same time, as I said before, it's necessary to control things as they're being controlled in the present moment in time. Well, why well, reckon we ain't getting enough association? Yeah. That's, my, that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, hopefully, if we, um, when the rest of the buildings have been done and the facilities are there, there'll be more association. I'm getting facilities, yes. I'm on classes and all that. I can't read or write. But once you get behind the door, I'll get the paranoid. How would you feel if you was a doctor and you can't in, read In or write? your position, I would feel just the same. You know, so I feel. People tend to think that because a judge says that one man's got... The, I mean, a judge doesn't say that one man does three difficult years in prison and a man does a life sentence and he's got to do it easy. 
put the staff in I mean, the punishment should fit the crime. Yeah, but the staff are treating us like six mumpers. We ain't six mumpers in here. No, I, I don't agree they with that. They are. Some of them. So. Some of them. That's all. So come off it. Well, well some I don't are. think you like six months. Oh, oh, you don't, but some of them do, but don't then they? again, I mean, I haven't worked with six months. I've only worked with lifers. Well, you've had 15 months up here for a couple yeah, of days. Yeah, only lodges, don't they? See? They sort of tend to have a sort of a Mr. Nice and a Mr. Nasty so that they can work one against the other with the prisoner. Unfortunately, we're up here that we're called um, mean and nasty, aren't we? <laughs> but, uh, and generally speaking, we get on all right with them. When we came up here, it was a bit difficult to start with because we sort of um, stood on them a bit and sort of um, tightened up the regime. But since then, they've, um, you know, they've got the hang of it. They know that we don't take anything from them they um, should have and we don't give them anything they shouldn't have. So, I mean... You know, it works out quite well. Which one of you is nasty and which one is mean? I think we're both um, mean and nasty at times. <laughs> Would you agree? Yeah. There always is the two sides. There's them and there's us, you know. But um, we come pretty close, you know, pretty close. We're, we're, the, we're the people they see in the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. So it's a pretty close relationship. Do you know what they've done? Do you know what crimes they're committing? Some of them, some of them. We don't, you don't get chance to find out all of them. I think that um, it's always necessary to know what a man's done um, to end up doing a life sentence. Um, personally, I, I think it's better not to know. It's, more, it's much easier to do a professional job if you don't know what they've done. Uh, it's much easier then to sort of try and treat them as, a, as equal. Don't you feel any revulsion? You're dealing with all men of murder? Yes, 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 at times I, yes, at times I do. But... Um, um, in my view, I mean, I would bring back the uh, death penalty and, um, you know, quite a number of people who are here at the moment wouldn't be here then. Then we could do more for those that were left. You'd be happy to be part of a prison that hangs? Certainly, yes. You wouldn't have any qualms about no, that? No, no, none whatsoever. You'd probably reflect the majority of public opinion about that. Oh, yes, well, yeah, I'm quite sure it would, yes. But um, nevertheless, I think it's um, something that's certainly necessary. I wouldn't say that it was a deterrent in the sense that everybody seems to think it is, but um, at the same time, I think we've quite a lot of people in prison who shouldn't be alive. On this landing? Some perhaps on this landing, yes. In the 16 months I spent on remand, I was in a hospital dormitory, and my window opened out onto the old topping shed, and next to it was the mortuary. And as I looked through the window, the skylight, you could see the beam. And I used to sit there just wondering what it was like for the condemned man to take a long walk. And I suppose it was basically instilled in me that the greatest crime in the world is to take somebody's life, which I have done. And to me, I deserved to be executed in that respect. There are times when I become morose even now. And I think to myself, I can't see no end to this. Perhaps I would have been better off by taking that long walk. Because you could accept it. Okay, so after three Sundays, you walked along the passage and that was the end. But now, there are times when the pressure is there on each of us. And you think, I can't carry on. I would have been better off. But the powers that be, back in 1960-odd, decided it was inhumane. But my answer to that is, isn't a life imprisonment sentence inhumane? I don't think a lot of people realise that it's, you don't get physical pressure in here, you get psychological pressure, and by Christ, it gets to a stage just want to pick up a table or anything that'll break and just bash it against the wall so that you can hear something go because you're in a room 12 by 8 with a door locked silence. exactly pure silence you've got two windows eight inches by five and in the summer it is worse than any boiler room mm -hmm. and combine that with 
torment inside for what you've done because if you show your remorse here, you're laughed at as you're all well aware of. And yet if you don't show remorse when you come up for your boards, that is frowned upon, you're hard, you're a hardened criminal, etc, etc. Mm. And so you, you're like that all the time inside, yeah. you're pulling against your thing, your guts just comes out. You just can't win. Mm. I should, be, I should be 65 when I come out if I do the 15. If I do an extra five, well, I should probably finish up down in our old boys' home down late or somewhere, or somewhere where they put them out to turf sort of thing. But uh, I'm too fit and mentally alert to let it worry me. I'm thankful that I've not been institutionalised as much as anybody else. I've seen people come in for three, four, five, six years and become institutionalised. I've become institutionalised although I won't admit it, and nor will none of, none of the others admit it, but if you see them and you, you can judge them, they do. Prison, prison just doesn't do anything good for you at all. Especially this prison. This prison is, is, is really, it's a punishment block for offenders. This is, this is what they hold up and say, well, if you misbehave yourself in a prison in the north or the south, we'll send you to Wormwood Scraps. All you've got to do if you have a lifer is to conform with prison rules and you're a good prisoner. It doesn't matter. I've known guys who knock screws out, cut people. And when they've got out, they've never been in trouble in their lives again. They've been hard men. But the day of the hard man in prison's gone. It's the rat and the snake who survives in prison. You've got to be double sly and be the hyena and give the false face, hello, good morning. And uh, it's a lie you're living. You can't really express yourself. I often feel like saying to a screw, why don't you just go and fuck yourself, you know? And when you do it, you see their face, they, they, they can't believe that you've said it to them. But another, there is a couple of screws here who would say, well, look, what's up, Trev? And I'm lucky, I'm on a landing where I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, the, the screws here aren't too bad in this landing, and that's the truth. There are some positive aspects to the serving of hours, days, weeks, months, years in prison. The work done here by lifers in the Scrubs Braille Unit every year produces hundreds of books and literature for the blind. Conjugal visits are not permitted in the British penal system. Most prisoners suffer from sexual deprivation, but not all. I prefer to be called Linda. But I spend a lot of time brushing my own conditioning and everything. Because to me, my eyes is important. And, uh, I just wouldn't let nobody cut me out, you know, even if the governor ordered it, because it's, it's just really important. I was a prostitute since I was 16. As soon as I left home, I was living with a man in Nottingham. And then since then, I've, 
up in Nottingham, Blackpool and London with living with different fellas. Drinking all the gay bars and gay clubs. I prefer all the gay company to any of the others. I wear dresses on the out as well sometimes, which I prefer to men's clothes. But I'm, I want in a sex change anyway. But uh, while I'm in here, there's no hope of getting one. I'm attracted to men, not just homosexuals, but attracted to straight guys as well. And I've been in cells on my last sentence, and when I've had remand times in, in Lincoln Prison before, well, I've been in, in a cell with another person and they've not been gay at all. But they've turned gay before one of us have left the cell. You know. It's just that uh, I've got the figure and the air and everything, so. So, it's just, there's a big demand for, for people like me in, in the prisons. But years ago, an homosexual, or puff as I call them, wouldn't be entertained on the wing. They'd be rejected by, by the inmates. But of course now it's sex offenders that's uh, rejected and it's gay people who are really accepted in, in the wings. But uh, to cut down homosexuality in prisons, I think they ought to have rubber dolls. Which, which would uh, certainly help to prevent homosexuality. Why have you got this life sentence? For the attempt to murder. Can you tell us something about that? Attempt to murder of a police officer in a, in a siege. When I was uh, drugged up and drunk at the same time. That was because I was taking an overdose. And I had the shotgun upstairs anyway. So the siege picked up from there, you see. So really, is all I was doing is taking an overdose. Uh, my affair. I, he went back to his ex-affair, who he lived with before he, he come with me, and I, I let him go, you know. What happened during the siege? Did uh, hurt, or? One detective was hit in the throat, just under the skin of his throat, with one pallet from a 12 bore shotgun. There's 300 pallets, approximately, in a cartridge. So it's not attempted murder. I was drugged and drunk. I, I don't even remember firing the shot at all. And then one was fired in the bed, or upstairs, two stories higher than the first shot. And one was fired in the floor. I don't even remember them. Did you make any demands during the siege? A million pound in helicopter. Where were you going to go in the helicopter? Well, I don't know. I don't know why I was even asking. But the money kept reducing, coming down and going up, and I even asked for a bottle of Perno in, in, as well in the end. How did you give up the siege? I woke up on, on the bed in the morning with the shotgun there, and the police had the place surrounded, and I threw the shotgun out the window, as they directed. You were given a life sentence for that? And I was given a life sentence. How long do you expect to do? About ten years, I think. But that's only because it was a police officer. How long have you done? Two years, four months. But I'll have another 18 months in this prison, and then I hope to go to Maidstone, where it's a smaller population. So you hope to get through these 10 years reasonably well? Yeah. I'm going to have a pair of breasts before I get out. That's whether they let me or not, I'll get them in the end one way or the other.
these are paintings that uh, I've done for a, a charity. They're going to be auctioned in November. They're, they're all reproductions, either from prints or photographs. This one is the Red Boy after Sir Thomas Lawrence. Um, this one is after Judith Lacer. That's a 17th century painting, originally. Uh, this one here particularly appeals to me. Um, this is Saint Cecilia after John Waterhouse, who was a Victorian artist. I've done a larger version of this one. It appeals to me because you know, I can see a lot of beauty in it, and there isn't a lot of that in this place at all. And uh, I'm always looking for subjects like that. When I was speaking to you the other day, you remember that you said you found this place a little unreal, and I agreed with you. Well, uh, I think I was wrong, because I thought about it afterwards. And uh, this place is really very real to me. I think that's the problem. To the public, this place is unreal, and it's understandable. The public doesn't want to see a reflection of itself in this place. And uh, it's very difficult. It creates barriers. There's no bridges at all walls and it's very difficult for everyone. My father died while I'd been in prison and nobody told me. So I went back to my own town and I couldn't stay at my mother's because I'm the black sheep of the family. So I went to stay with this chap who had invited me to stay with him. But one of the conditions of my staying there was that I indulged in homosexual activities with him. And uh, I couldn't respond because I'm not homosexual. I didn't hold it against him because he was. But there was a masochistic side to his homosexuality which I found it very hard to handle. And I was only there three days, and I was due to leave the next day. And we had a serious argument, a serious argument about his life and about my life, because they were both in wrecks, because he'd been married and I'd been married. And we were arguing, and I, I threatened him. And he said, and I said, I'll let you if you don't, if you don't stop. And he said, no, I want you to me. And he planted the seed, and the seed grew. He went through to the bedroom, and uh, it's pretty frightening now even talking about it, I've got to admit it. And uh, I, he called me through, and I, was in the, and I went through to the kitchen, and I picked up a hammer that was on the side. I've lived that night a thousand times, and as far as I can remember, I was going to threaten him with it. That and no more. But somewhere between the kitchen and the, the bedroom, I went over the top. He saw me come in. He saw, he must have known what I was about to do, and either through shock or fear, or both, he just lay there. And... Uh, I struck him with a hammer on the head. I never, I never heard any sound at all. I never heard anything. I, I felt alienated from it, if you like. It was almost as though I was standing back and watching somebody else do it. I felt a great deal of fear. But I couldn't relate to the situation at all. It, I, I was alien from it. Anyway, I, I hit him more than once. I don't know how many times I hit him. And I heard a crashing sound. I thought it, it sounded like a vase smashing, but it was his skull hitting the wall. And. Um, so I, I, I seemed to snap out of it, and I went back next door, and he was making a lot of noise because he wasn't dead, and I couldn't understand why he wasn't dead, and I went back through and switched the light on and saw what I'd done. The one thing I can never forget is the smell, because his, his brains were exposed. In fact, they were over the wall, on the bed, on the floor, and me. And I, I wanted to run. I wanted to get away. But I couldn't leave him fighting for his life and I, I couldn't leave him. That was it. So I went back next door and I picked up the phone and I, I phoned the police. I said, I've just killed somebody. I, I, he wasn't dead, but I, that's what I said. I remember the, the woman surprised at the other end of the phone. And she, I, I found out afterwards that she was a trainee and it, it must have really frightened her. And she said, you stay where you are, you know. Don't, don't, don't go, just stay where you are. And I couldn't stay. I couldn't stay because I could hear him next door and I couldn't stay there. I couldn't take any more. And I ran down the stairs and I went out the back and over the fence and started to run. There must have been a police car in the area because he came up. And by the time I, I thought, well, where am I going to go? So I came back. And as I came back, the police officer was coming back down the stairs. And he met me. He'd just seen what I'd done upstairs, and he met me. He was coming down for his first aid equipment. It must have terrified him, because I was covered in blood. And he'd just seen that upstairs. And, and, and I, I, because I was myself then, as it were, as near as I could be under the circumstances, I said to him, don't, don't, don't it's OK, don't be afraid. Because I knew he must have been afraid. He was nearly crying. And he was a man that knew me. In a little country town like that, everybody knows you. 
He knew me since I was a child. The life sentence was right. I was given a life sentence for manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Um, a doctor diagnosed me as a psychopath. To be honest, Rex, that word psychopath doesn't mean a great deal to me. It's a label and it sets me apart from society. Um, if, if, if society could relate to what I did, they don't want to do that. They don't want to see that. So I can understand it because society's got enough on its plate. I, I mean, and, and there I am doing a thing like that. I can't be normal in their eyes. I, ca I, I can't be a human being to be able to do that because it was a terrible thing. I've destroyed something and, and there's nothing I can do to change that. But I do care, you know. I care and I've always cared and I'll always go and care what I've done. I, I mean, I can't forget it in my sleep. If I try to forget it when I'm awake, I have to forget it when I'm asleep. I'm lucky, Rex. Uh, I've got this. Uh, some men can't even read, you know. What it's like then, I don't know. But it's difficult. I mean, I've been in prison before, as you know, on small sentences for petty offences. But it wasn't like this. It's... Sometimes I can feel it. When I step out the door, I can feel the tension and I feel afraid. I'm not... I, I don't mind admitting that. Sometimes I feel afraid. Because if, if I ignore the fear, then I'm going to be in trouble. I'd only been here a couple of weeks when somebody was stabbed in the tailors right in front of me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> prisons I've been in before, I've never seen anything like that. And the guy just came up to me and said, I said, where are my scissors? He said, oh, I've just stuck them in somebody. He didn't care, you know. I'm not saying that is an accurate picture of the men in this wing. A lot, there's a lot of good men in this wing. I've got friends in this wing, people who are, I'd be happy to call friends but there are one or two who I like to avoid. Um, it's not a case of judging, it's a case of survival. To offend against prison discipline can lead a man to the block. Here are punishment cells and a segregation unit. This houses inmates who have asked for protection or are considered too dangerous for normal location. On D-Wing, most lifers do not present a threat to authority. But there is a minority who have to be watched with extra care. These prisoners, some of the most dangerous men in the British penal system, are classed as Category A. All Category A's, they're either considered to be a danger to the public, a danger to the place, or a danger to the state. All terrorists are considered to be a danger to the state. It means that any visitor I have has to be um, vetted by the police. Inside, it means that all my movements are logged in the Category A book. Um, I can't go anywhere without an officer. All Category A's are moved separate to other prisoners round about the jail. Um, I have a special cell, Category A cell. Got extra set of bars on, reinforced out of walls. Uh, it's got a Category A um, mark on the door, uh, capital A. Uh, How do the other prisoners react to you? Well, other prisoners are sometimes advised not to associate too much with Category A prisoners. Um, category A prisoners considered to be subversive, uh, troublemakers and that type of thing, you know. Have you ever been violent or subversive? I've been a bit subversive because uh, I advise other inmates of their rights in prison and uh, means and ways around uh, the regulations, things like that. But what about violence? Yeah, I've been violent in prison oh, and in other institutions that I've been in. But if I can pick up your story, you broke your license and then went to another approved school. school and from there I went to uh, Rampton. What was I was in the approved school 
I was uh, charged with attempted murder on a, uh, another boy there, you know, and I was sent to Renton uh, as a moral defector under the 1930 Amendment Deficiency Act. And uh, three years later, I attacked a nurse with an iron bar. Um, for which I received a 20-year restriction order from the from the, uh, the assize court, the judge. And uh, that wouldn't have ended until next year. Um, my life in uh, Rampton was uh, rather turbulent for the five years uh, preceding uh, the attack on the nurse. I spent uh, five years virtually in solitary confinement, or seclusion as they call it there. You know, I, I'd uh, spend three months in, that'd get me up for a couple of weeks. And uh, the charge nurse is like, you don't look very well, uh, David. He says, I think it's time you were put back in seclusion. And I'm back into seclusion. And... Um, they were afraid you would attack people? I, I was... Uh, yes. You then went to Broadmoor. And at Broadmoor, of course, you had this incident. Uh, I started off by taking hostages. I held two hostages there by myself. Neither of the hostages came to any harm. There was never any intention on my part to actually harm them. Um, I was emotionally involved with a, a young, a young patient there, and uh, in 1977, uh, Bob and a lad called uh, Alan uh, held my mate. Uh, Philip hostage, you know, and d during a hostage situation, uh, Alan uh, actually uh, raped him. And a few weeks later, uh, when Alan came out of seclusion, he actually came up to me and bragged what he was doing, what he'd done, you know. Uh, so uh, when I actually saw Maudsley or Bob, I. Uh, asked him exactly what happened and uh, Bob confirmed that uh, during the night uh, Philip was uh, raped. So I said to uh, Bob that it was my intention to kill Alan for what he'd done. And uh, over a three month period uh, I, uh, I, I actually uh, planned the whole thing out, you know got to remember that this actually happened in a, a maximum security ward, you know, uh, equivalent to a block in prison. And uh, on a Saturday morning, following a football match, uh, we actually um, took Francis uh, hostage, if you like, hostage, you know, but um, barricaded the door up and uh, over a two or three hour period, uh, I assaulted him a few times, kicking him in the ribs and things like that. Well, at the actual time, I knew precisely what I was doing. I knew that what I was doing was wrong. And I knew the consequences of my action. Um, a couple of hours, or about two o'clock on the day, Francis said to me, he says, uh, I know you're going to kill me get it over with, you know. And uh, Bob said, uh, or I said to Bob rather, I said, uh, pass me the garrote. So we uh, both strangled him there and then. You know, he, he was tied up. We tied his hands, tied his hands to his feet so he couldn't move. And uh, after uh, strangling him for about a minute, I said to Robert, I says, uh, he's dead, you know, because um, he urinated, uh, all the muscles relaxed, a lot went, and I, I believed he was dead, you know. I, I even checked his pulse, and I said to Bob, I said, he's got no pulse, he's dead, you know. Um, and uh, Bob wasn't uh, satisfied that, that Alan was dead, you know. So uh, he strangled him again, and he put 240 volts from a record player laid through his chest. You know, 
and uh, we covered him up. And about nine hours later, uh, I summoned uh, the nurse who was outside the room. I said, uh, this is a murder case. How could you do such a thing? Such an evil thing to this man? I don't know. I don't know to this day. You know, it's... Uh, it was a hor horrendous thing to do, you know. Uh, possibly because I know what violence feels like, because I, I've had uh, extreme violence used on me. You know, I, I nearly lost. My, after I attacked the nurse in uh, 1963, I had extreme violence used on me. Um, persistent violence, you know, um, systematic. So, and uh, I nearly lost my life. Doctors thought I was dying. I had a ruptured kidney and uh, I was black and blue at the toe, you know. So, in some ways, I've become accustomed to violence, you know. I knew what violence was all about, you know. I'd seen violence around me all the years that I spent in Rampton. Um, and it was a everyday occurrence to me. I, I was living with very violent men. I've had many labels attached to me over the years, you know, from being maladjusted, moral defective, and uh, eventually uh, a psychopath. I dispute the fact that I'm a psychopath. I believe, I accept the fact that I have a, a personality disorder. Uh, but I don't believe personally that uh, that personality disorder amounts uh, to psychopathic disorder, certainly not within the definition of the Mental Health Act, you know, because uh, all the doctors agree on one thing, that I'm not treatable, that I don't suffer from a, a treatable disorder. And it's my argument that if I'm uh, not treatable, then I don't actually suffer from a psychopathic disorder, you know, it's a personality disorder. What I'm actually doing, I'm bearing my soul, you know. I'm, I'm putting my, standing naked before you, really. A thing that I, I wouldn't even do with staff, prison officers, you know, or, or other prisoners, you know. But I know you felt you wanted to say something about regret. Yeah, well, I, I have a number of regrets. Um, I re deeply regret the suffering not, of course, to others, it, even though. Um, at the time, I thought I, I was justified in what I did, you know. But uh, there can be no justification for taking another man's life. I'm very ashamed uh, of the disgrace and the shame I brought on my own family, you know, because uh, there's many victims, you know. There's not only the person who lost his life, there's all his family. They're all victims. There's all my family. They're all victims. And uh, least but not, uh, last but not least, there's myself. I'm a victim. I'm a, a victim of my own actions. You know, I, I'm a, also a victim of the system. I, I've spent 23 years inside. Uh, another regret of mine is that I haven't led a normal life. I don't know what it is to lead a normal life, you know. I've never married, you know. I'd like to have married. I'd like to have had uh, children. I'd like to have brought the children up and watch them growing up and do the things that fathers do, you know. Uh, but that's something that I'll, I'll probably never experience. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm very sad about that. Do you think you'll ever be released? No, I don't. You know, uh, from where I'm sat now, uh, I accept the fact that if I, if I am ever released, I'll probably be an old man and infirm. You know, I can't see the Home Office uh, uh, accepting that responsibility. And I have to admit it would be a terrible uh, responsibility for anyone to accept to release me.
Swinton Hall in Staffordshire is a prison for young offenders. It also contains 30 lifers, the oldest 21, the youngest 16. Those who were under 18 years of age at the time of the offence are detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, the equivalent of life imprisonment. There is an unusual degree of care and concern by prison staff for these young people, whose crimes can range from murder to arson, from rape to assault. There are educational facilities up to A-level standard, work training schemes and sport. When life has reached the age of 22, like other young prisoners, they must leave the sheltered world of Swinton Hall to continue their life sentence at a man's prison. Martin, at almost 22, is one of them. I, I left school, did six months on the Dow. My brother suggested that we go self-employed. Uh, from going from nine pound a week on the Dow, giving my mother five pound a week and having four pound to myself. From that till 80, 90, 100 pound a week. It's unbelievable, I could do what I want go where I want, spend as much as I want, stay out when I want. It was great, it was, you know, it was like being rich, you know, from nine pound a week. And uh, I started off drinking when I was 13, um, mixing with people of in the mid-20s. Um, I was drinking seven, six, seven, eight, nine pints at uh, 13, 14. Um, going out, I mean, I didn't enjoy it because I was throwing up everywhere when I was going out to pubs making a right mess of myself, embarrassing people. And I gradually progressed into neon being an alcoholic. Um, we went to one nightclub and we, they wouldn't let us in. And we went to the, the Lafayette nightclub in Wolverhampton. And uh, we had three breakers in there, quite a bit to drink like. We come out and while we was in there, there was a bit of trouble, a bit of shouting going on. But we didn't want any trouble, we was only out for a good night's drink. And um, a couple of lads started pushing the weight about. We told them we didn't know no trouble. And um, we got outside, like, and we all jumped in the car. And there was a car in front of us. And uh, we followed it off, being a one-way street. And they were giving us abuse out, out the windows, like. And uh, we gave them abuse back, kind of thing, right? What we thought at the time, there were the two, lots of two gangs together. These four lads had come behind us. And my brother got out of the car then, and I was still talking to these lads. And um, there was quite a bit of shouting and swearing going on between us. And then my brother got out and opened the boot of the car. He grabbed a four-foot level. Um, he ran across the road and he hit one of these lads across the back, the big lad, in a bomber jacket. Um, I turned around to have a look what was going on because I was still talking to these lads. And I seen these lad, these four or five lads onto my brother. So I run to the boot of the car. I, I don't, don't know what made me do it to him to this day. I put my hand in the boot and I grabbed the level. And I, I've never used a weapon in my life, you know. And um, I went across the road and this fence was only about this big. And I wasn't swinging the level, I was doing, just holding it, you know. And uh, I jumped over the railings and when I landed, all the beer rushed to my head, you know, after having so much beer. And I was swaying a bit, and when I opened my eyes, this, this lad threw a punch at me. And I just swung, I just, I just swung with the level. I didn't aim or pick a place out where to hit him, I just swung it. And unfortunately for this lad, he hit him across the top of the head. What were your feelings when you realised that the lad you'd hit with the implement had, had, had died? I was totally shocked, because uh, those things you hear them on the radio, you, you see them on the telly and you read them in the paper. You, you never believe it's going to happen to yourself. And uh, I was devastated, I really was. Then I found out 
who the lad was and I knew him and I knew his parents and it hurt even more, you know, it really, really hurt. And I just couldn't believe it, you know. I still can't believe it now, really. You were then given a life sentence for the yes. crime. Did you plead guilty or no. you plead not guilty to murder? Well, it should have been. I, to, um, mur murder was, no, life for murder was wrong, but life for manslaughter would have been right. It's not the sentence that bothers me. It's a principle of thing. I mean, we never went out with the intention of killing that lad. Uh, what we done was wrong, a lad died. And I accept that, and I accept a life sentence for it. But it's a principle that we did not go out to kill that lad. Um, manslaughter would have been the right charge, if you like, and the right conviction, and a life sentence given for that. But a life sentence given for murder was totally wrong, in my opinion. But you're leaving tomorrow, aren't you? Yes, I'm... And what are you feel about that, and where are you going? Gartry, maximum security prison. Um, that was a real shock to me, because I've done miracles since I've been here. I mean, I come away from school with no qualifications whatsoever, and I've taken six exams um, since I've been here. I've got a very good job. As life has gone, it's just a trustee's job, although I cannot go outside the prison or near the gate, which is obvious reasons for security. Um, and I'm just shattered. I, I just can't believe it that they'd send me to a place like that, you know. Dartree Prison, where Martin is going, is a new lifer centre for adults. I don't think you'll ever change this place because it's not the surrounding, it's the place itself, it's the people that's in it, the members of staff. You know, they've got a good working relationship there. It's not your average prison. It's this is not prison, you know, it's it's not the true prison, your local mix, your greens, your wakefields. This is it's a special regime. You're lucky, you're very lucky. <laughs> the majority of women knifers begin their time in prison in Durham jail and then transfer here to Style Prison near Manchester for the middle years of their sentence. Most of them, unlike the men, committed their crimes in domestic circumstances. Being in prison, can coincide with a woman's childbearing years. It can mean separation from husband and children, for some of these women serving life imprisonment are also mothers. And this is probably more traumatic from a woman doing a life sentence than from a man. I think a woman's life is bounded by time factors, monthly periods for a start off. And it's very, very hard to tell a woman you're going nowhere, you're doing a life sentence, but yes, you're growing older, and when you grow, when you go out, all right, you may have been desirable to men outside before you came in, but you'll be going out to a different situation. And all women like to think time stands still, and it doesn't. And this is one of the very hard things for a woman to cope with when she's doing a life sentence. When a woman kills, it is really passions unleashed. This crime of passion syndrome, I would say, is more evident within the small group of lifers that you have in the women's side of the prison service than it is in the men's. Men will rob and kill for money. A woman's usually done it with someone else in mind. I do. No one's noticed that. Seventeen days. Nigel, for £100, 
and a place in the final. What is a widget? Widget. Widget. Can you spell it? W I D G E O N. Widget, silly pigeon. It's a guess. It's a time for cooking utensil. If not, it's all not for the cook. Barry, Barry, do you know what a widget is? Is it a bird? Oh, I don't laugh, man. It's um, what what sort of a bird? Is it a type of pigeon? It's not. It's not. It's a wild duck. <laughs> Met this guy right through a friendship society, and the kids were with my mum, and I went off with him, and was staying in this um, guest house. When the money ran out, right, he says, we'd have to do some burglaries. So I said, yeah, all right. I was doing burglaries and with the money we got, I was just staying in different guest houses. Didn't look for work or anything like that. Then, what I'm in for, this old lady. We were actually in the house and she had this safe and she wouldn't open the safe. So I took her upstairs and battered her head in with the building brick. Then we went off to this guest house in, I think, it's in Blackpool, this one. Then we eventually went to Manchester and I saw it on a billboard. <clears throat> Northwest wealthy widow battered to death. And I says to Colin, that's us, you know. And he says, no. I think I went to Scarborough after that. That's where we got arrested for burglary. Because I did some burglaries there. Then in the afternoon in the police station, says to me that Colin had admitted to the murder that happened in Chester. I didn't believe them because they set you up anyway. But it was true. So they took us to Chester. I was charged with murder. You were the accessory? I was charged with murder. That's what I'm doing a life sentence for. Were you there when the old lady was battered to death? It wasn't. The old lady was in the bathroom. I was on the landing. Could have saved her, I suppose. Could have wanted my head battering in as well. But you don't think about that at the time. Why did he do this? Because you wouldn't open the safe. And because he's a psychopath. I think he actually enjoyed doing it. You couldn't have restrained him, stopped him? S saying it now, probably could, if it happened now, but not then. I was too frightened. Just getting involved with a complete stranger. Being gullible, just believe anything any, anyone tells me. Still do. And when I don't say promise, promise. No confidence. But you never egged him on. You never said to him, we must get that money. I don't care how you get it. No. How comes you met this man? Through the friendship society, like I said. I saw the address in the paper and wrote to it. And sent me loads of details of 
different guys. And he only lived in Nottingham. Don't <laughs> laugh, it's not funny. So I wrote to him and he came to the house. Was that the way you wanted to meet a man? No. Couldn't meet one ordinarily. No one would look at me. Why? No. Why would no one look at you? You're an attractive woman. They only want you for one thing. I'd probably give them that impression. So you met him? Some, some sort of character you met? Yeah. Had you no idea what sort of man he was? Or? No, I didn't care. He showed me a bit of affection, didn't he? Doesn't take much to please me. <laughs> How are they supposed to judge if you're fit to be let into society again? I don't know, because who's to say that we are? Because they don't really know us anyway. They only know us by reports and things that they do on us. I wrote to my mother today and I says that no one knows me like she knows me. They don't. Are we seeing... It's in the real Joyce. Because you're real with me, so I'm being real with you. The real Joyce isn't loud. Just come over like that. It's shy in a way. How long were you, you were in love with Colin? The man you eventually had this affair with and it sort of lent, ended in disaster. Until they stopped into prison visits. It's about four weeks afterwards. Is that Colin on your hand? Yeah. Who are the other names on, the, on your hand? The father of my children. My mother. But this place has been a sort of... You managed to get through the six years. Yeah. Do you think it's changed you? Are you a different Joyce now than when you first sort of came? No. I think I had a lot of things in there. I, I don't mean, think prison does change you. You're still the same person. It's all right saying, oh, let Joyce out. She's really changed. She's so nice. No, I'm not. I can be nice. But it's not changed my views on many things. Such as? Prison. Prison officers. There's us and them. But if you were to be let out tomorrow, would there be a sort of repetition of events? Would it lead no. to some... You're saying that for my benefit? No. No. But everybody wants their freedom, but... I want to see my children. The prospect of enduring barren years in prison leads some lifers to despair. In the United States, there have been several recent cases of murderers demanding their own death. Dennis, here seen in Wakefield Prison, sees no point in living. After serving 12 years for attempted murder, he went straight for seven years. But in a quarrel, he murdered his mother and was given a life sentence with a recommended minimum of 20 years. These judicial recommendations are rarely ignored. After a life of crime, 
I reformed, if one can use the term, um, led an honest and industrious life. And after seven and a half years, the lot went for nothing, just over a silly argument. I've got nothing to look forward to. Um, there's no hope. There's uh, no hope, period. I'd be better off having my life terminated. Yet they won't do it. The opinion is that hanging is barbaric, uh, which I think it is. But surely a person should have um, some form of system whereby, um, say for instance, um, three capsules two doctors that administer them. One's lethal and two isn't lethal. So no doctor would know which one give the lethal dose and receive all three injections. I believe in that, another form of euthanasia. It would save a lot of trouble, a lot of expense, and therefore the person would pay for the crime. But in my opinion, hanging is no deterrent, it's no deterrent hanging. I, I've always maintained that. It's no deterrent. Because the majority of murders happen on the spur of the moment. Now if hanging was in force, I would have hung. And yet there was no intent, there was no premeditation. So therefore, Hanging wasn't a deterrent in my case, in the majority of domestic cases, which mine in this instance is. I don't know the figures, but there must be about 15 to 1600 lifers at the moment. Next year there's going to be more, the year after more. When's the saturation point going to be reached? What are they going to do about all these men with 20 years, 25, 30 years recommendation? They'll have to do something. So why don't they do it now? Hang on. Or bring in the euthanasia. All the major decisions about when and if a lifer is released are taken here in the Home Office. His file contains the record of his journey through the lifer system. In the beginning, his progress is assessed jointly by the Home Office and the Parole Board, then follow further reviews by committees. His file grows with reports by prison staff. His freedom is finally decided by people he will never know or meet. For a lifer is presented not in person, but on paper. It is then the Home Secretary's task to release or not to release. He has the last word. A panel of the Parole Board must include a High Court judge, a psychiatrist, a senior member of the Probation Service, an independent member and Home Office advisors. They will consider release by studying a dossier of reports on a lifer's behaviour in prison, his current state of mind, his prospects for employment, his family, and above all, whether letting him out might be a threat to public safety. Before release is granted, the views of the Lord Chief Justice and the original trial judge are considered. This is a 33-year-old man who's served seven and a quarter years. He pleaded guilty to murdering his father, stabbed him with a knife after an argument. The independent member presents this case. A bitter relationship between father and son over many years. At the time of the trial, the sentencing judge made no recommendation and subsequently advised that eight years would be the minimum appropriate and ten years more appropriate for the offence. He served seven and a quarter and the Lord Chief Justice supported the recommendation. The prisoner was no stranger to the courts when at the age of 26 he was given this life sentence. All his previous offences are against property. More recently, uh, before this offence, he was on several occasions in hospital for treatment for depression. 
And then we, the build up to the actual offence, he was uh, discharged to a community home. This didn't suit him, so he took himself off. And ten days before the murder, went to live with his father. The fatal outcome of this we now know, and the details of the offence are fully recorded in the dossier. The first three years of his sentence brought intense depression and withdrawal. After three years, the assistant governor commented that thanks to a high level of staff support in the prison, this man had emerged from a depression and seemed to be cured of it. And he cites three main reasons for what he describes as a quite remarkable change in this prisoner's character. First, that he's come to terms with his offence and the sentence with acceptance of guilt. Secondly, increased self-confidence in relationships and ability through the training in the prison. And thirdly, the discovery that he is after all valued by some members of his family after reconciliations with two of his sisters and a developing relationship with his girlfriend. In 1978, the assistant governor considered that this man should do less than an average life sentence. And in 78, the consultant psychiatrist reported that he shows appropriate remorse for the killing, uh, does not show any pathological guilt regarding the offence. He may well be a suitable candidate for early parole. So the signs were there four years ago that, that things are looking up. So you rather inclined yes, I would. I would be to sooner rather than later. Yes. Anthony, how do you feel about that? Well, although this man had many previous convictions, he had none for violence. The judge. As this crime centered on his hatred for his father, it is not likely to be repeated. Yes. Accordingly, there seems a minimal risk that he will commit a violent crime if released. Mm. He's rightly, in my view, going to be tested in open conditions. And I agree with the proposal that he be referred to the local review committee at some period after his arrival there. I had thought 12 months appropriate, but uh, I would like to hear what the prison department say. I th think that it's tempting to say give him a date for release and a transfer to open conditions. The psychiatrist and chairman of the panel. The date for release would be as it always is, subject to satisfactory behaviour. Um, mainly, you know, to put him on the spot oh, oh, I'm, yes. and say, OK, now look, here's the deal. Well, does he get that when, when he goes to open? I mean, what is he expecting when he goes to open? I fear this man may not think much at all. He's been in so many institutions, including psychiatric hospitals, that this will just be one more move. And I think I'd like to make some point to it. And say, I would like okay, him to know, certainly, that we're... Here's we're, the we're, last fence. He's not what for nine it? months, going back to a point we considered in another case, just a little encouragement, hint to him, that he has a very good chance of getting out. And this is an instance where I would say we should do the unusual, and mm. say a review after nine months. Mm. I got down six months, actually, but I know that's, that was being slightly Well, we're advised that's there. not sufficient for them to get well, I know, it's, a it's, good it's, view of the matter. Yeah. Then our settled view, I think, is more or less this, that he is transferred to open conditions, but he's reviewed not a day later than nine months yes. yep. after he arrives in that prison. Yep. Expedition is what's needed yes. here, isn't it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. have got it all, Colin. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go on to another case with a lady colleague. Keith's case is similar to the one the parole board considered. He was given a life sentence for the murder of a member of his family. Having begun in a maximum security prison, Keith has progressed through various stages and various jails and is now approaching his last lap to freedom, for this is Lay Hill Open Prison near Bristol. Can you go any further? No, it's as far as I can go. Out of bounds over there. Not difficult to escape though, is it, if you want to? Not really, but uh, chances are there if you want to take them up. There's no way I'd do it. Too much to lose? Well, I think so. I mean, uh, once you get caught, there's no way you're going to get out, I don't think. Mm -hmm. You get one chance and I think that's it. Um, how do you feel? How long have you been at Lay Hill? Five months, thereabouts. Five months this week, I think it is. It's uh, long enough, I think, for this place. Uh, they say it's uh, 
help break me back into society, but I haven't been anywhere, I haven't seen anybody, I just exist from day to day. It's like uh, any other prison, really. You know, the fact that you've got a fence around you instead of a wall doesn't make that much difference. You're still held back, aren't you? Mm. Or are you going to get away from the fact that it is a prison? I mean, there must be a reason for my being here, but until they tell me or, you know, I, I don't know. I can't see what they're after. I mean, it's, it's typical of the life sentence anyway, isn't it? They don't tell you whether there's anything wrong with you or, uh, you know, if there is something wrong with you, what you've got to do co to correct it. It's just trial and error. Wait till they decide to say, yeah, we think you're okay. You're, you know, you're not going to go out and recommit a crime. Um, and that's it. It's in existence. It's got to come to an end sometime, isn't it? As I always say, you either walk out and they carry you out. There's no two ways about that. I look on it as like, it's like a carrot, isn't it? Dangled in front of the donkey. Play my cards right, I can be out there someday. And, uh... It's gonna come in time. This is a very easy place to be a prisoner, but it isn't. It's extremely hard. And without being too cold-blooded about it, I'm delighted that they have to deal with a considerable amount of worry, anxiety, pain, and distress. They're certainly going to meet this on release. There isn't any long-term prisoner in the country who is prepared for release. And I would say that as a, a flat statement without qualification at all. Nobody is ready for release. It's a shock. George was given a life sentence for the murder of his girlfriend. That was 10 years ago. He's just been informed that after 18 months at Lay Hill, it's time for a day out. <laughs> Despite Keith's misgivings, prison staff have decided that he, like George, should be subjected to an afternoon in Bristol. To the reality of life outside. Jesus, what a mess. First time. Action <laughs> <Some> success. <laughs> How'd you try, Ty? Can't remember. I think I've been better off going without. Restricted. How long did you want a jacket, tie, suit? Jackets like any coat, but tie and that. Been over ten years now. How does it feel? Uncomfortable. <laughs> okay then. No rude comments about women drivers, right? Close your eyes, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> you're not nervous, Keith, are you? No, you're not nervous. No, I just look like... You've just all told him about my... Keith will be accompanied by an assistant governor and George by a senior prison officer. Right, what's that? Okay. How much are they? The first one's telling you how much you're paying. Yeah. Uh, how many litres you're getting. That's the price per litre. And the end one's telling you how much you're spending on it. But we want it full up, so just keep going. 
and it'll cut out automatically when the tank's full. First time, first time I saw them, this new money was when I was at Wakefield. They used to pay you, used to pay you out at Wakefield in new money. In new money, yeah. they paid you the actual yeah. cash. In the actual ah. cash. It was a bit strange when I first went out. Everybody yeah. was taking the Mickey like saying, "Oh, look, there's a cow, and there's a car, and something like yeah. that." Does it seem funny being in a car? Because uh, obviously you've only been in the transit. I've only been the in the transit. It's uh, it just hasn't really sunk in yet. Yeah. It's, uh, so it must be most unusual. Think, yeah. It's yeah. a bit nervous because it's um, you know the first time in a long time. It's uh, it just hasn't sunk in that I'm actually going out going somewhere out, yeah. instead of being stuck in the prison all the yeah. time. Right. Let's have a look at the old piece on it. They do a lot of progressive, you see. It's all after my age, good. I mean, it's getting over more, is it? <laughs> I think we're about five quid when I come in. Yeah. As I said, this is a re yeah. reasonably, reasonably cheap shop. Right? Yeah. So, I really think I'd better stop inside myself. <laughs> It's cheaper we'll to be in. Yeah. It's cheaper to be in there than in here. Out here. When he has gone down 99. Just get a pair for nothing, don't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yours are yours far better quality. Yeah, if you want to get a better pair for nothing, I'll leave See, once you've actually seen something you're interested in, you go over to the desk and you ask one of the receptionists over there. Give them the number. And you give them the number, you know. I'll give you the details and um At the moment I wouldn't stand a chance. Why not? They're skilled, aren't they? But then you've always got the other things that you can fall back on if you didn't get your qualification before you finished. There's always the other things you could drop back on and try and do it at night classes, but you find better to do it before you're discharged. Various bits and get a little my young son. see the old postcards. Yeah. Reproduction of the old get, Yeah, various things of that. Yeah. If you could wander up to the counter for us and get us half a dozen first class stamps, will you? <laughs> Save me bothering while I have a look here. Town. Six first class stamps, please. Thank you. Right, thanks a lot, Tap. Yep, Tap. That's it. Okay. Yeah, these are six stamps and there's your change. Thanks a lot. Cheers. <laughs> How much were there when you came in? Six pence or something like that. Six old P. Yeah, six old P. No, it's a fifteen and a half. Fifteen and a half UP, yeah. that's what. Yeah. Three shillings, isn't it? Three, three, three shillings. Three and tuppence, isn't it? 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 How do you feel this day has been, Quiet? Absolutely fantastic. The prices of the things has shook me very much. I mean, I... Seven years ago, or nine years ago, I paid tuppence for a carrier. So I had to pay 15 pence, which to me is all wrong. But the rest of the day was very good. And the person what took me was very good indeed, so I enjoyed myself very much. But the prices of the things are very, risen very much indeed, so. What, would, what, what do you hope for now? That I get out and I can become, I'll say, a well, well, worth, well worth member of the society again. After today, I. I hope I can do, after the showing of today. But you, you don't know when you're going to get out? No, do you? I don't know. I'm still waiting for an answer. Yeah. I hope it's within the next two months. I hope I'll get an answer within the next two months. Yeah.
but uh, otherwise it's all right. Now I'm back to becoming a <laughs> con again. <laughs> yeah? As we finished filming George, he received welcome news. Five seven three zero four four. George Ernest Francis Norris, the Secretary of State, has decided upon the recommendation of the parole board that subject to his continued good conduct and satisfactory arrangements being made for his resettlement, this prisoner should be released on the 7th of October 1983 and should be informed accordingly. You must be joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> It be made what did you say in the car? Yes. I said it's been a fantastic day and it would be a fitting end that I've got my day today. But I didn't know how to sit in the car, but I knew. I wouldn't show you. It shall be made clear to him that this is a provisional date only and that it is subject to the requirements indicated in paragraph one. That's your continued good conduct and satisfactory arrangements for your resettlement. He should also be told that conditions requiring him on release to place himself under the supervision of a probation officer to reside and work only where approved by that probation officer and possibly other conditions will be included in his license. It should be decided that Morris should spend a period on the working out scheme at Kingston prior to his release and transfer instructions will be issued in due course. Kingston? Kingston, that's where you wanted to go, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then. I'm sure you're no, already you've got to the, the South Hampton, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. What date did I say? 7th of October. When? Next year. That's right. Okay. But how certain can you be that men who've killed won't kill again? If you want to be quite sure that somebody will never kill again, sure, never kill again, there's only one thing you can do about it. You take them out and hang them. That is the only way you'll ever be sure. If you are not going to do that, then a life sentence which does allow a man to be released to some extent at any rate on the basis of his ability to prove that he can now cope with conditions that manifestly he couldn't cope with before. Life sentence is the only way you're going to find this out. If he's got a determinate sentence, he doesn't have to try. He knows where the date of release will be. If he's actually got something to work for, then this gives him an incentive to try and a degree of motivation that no other sort of prisoner has. Our lifers work harder for their release than any other people in prison anywhere. And from that point of view, yes, I think it's not only justified, I think it's an excellent arrangement. When Keith eventually gets his date of release, he, like almost all other lifers, must spend six months based in a hospital attached to a prison. A lifer can be recalled to prison at any time if the Home Office receives reports of serious misbehaviour, even if he has not committed an offence. He has no right to appear before a court. He can only appeal to the parole board from prison. If his appeal fails, he continues to serve his life sentence until deemed fit for release. John was recalled for threatening his second wife. Now he is on his way out for the second time. Well, it's been 22 years. Uh, I was given a life sentence in 1960, or I ended prison in 1959. Christmas Day, 1959. Uh, I killed my wife by pushing her over a cliff. We've been to a party, uh, a little bit of alteration. I'm not too clear on the details, but it was an argument and I pushed and over she went. I suppose if I'd been sober, I wouldn't have, I would have realised that there was something seriously wrong, but she was conscious, coherent. And we got back to our house, I put her to bed. I woke up the next morning to find a dead wife. I, the doctor just lived along the road from me. And the doctor pronounced her dead. The police were called. I was taken into custody. And four and a half months later, life sentence. And it went on from there. I was eventually released from this hostel in 1970. 12 years. 
I eventually remarried, bought a house, settled down. I was fairly ill physically during this period, although I didn't realize at that time how ill I was. And my marriage started going wrong. The probation service were called in, and I was recalled to prison in 1974, November. Here I am on the hospital again, 1982. Another eight years. 20 years, you know. I was never charged with any criminal offence on recall. I don't argue the case for recall. What I do argue is the length of time I spent on it, the lack of facilities to prevent presented a defence. In point of fact, you were first recalled to prison and then told why. That's for your side of the argument. It's very difficult to argue from inside a prison cell. Because although I've ever only been convicted of one offence, the crime of murder, I'm bracketed as a thief, a liar, a cheat or whatever, by the very fact of being in prison. Who am I to argue? Convicted. No defence. Because you're on a life licence for all of your life, aren't for you? For the end of my life, yes. When you're given a life sentence? Yes. Everyone assumes that someone who is killed has no conscience, no feelings, no emotions. It isn't true, you know. It isn't true at all. All right, 20 years in prison, 22 years in prison. Is that my punishment? Not a bit of it. That's the very least part of it. My punishment is living with myself. You try living with a thing like that on your mind. And I'm not looking for pity. Uh, but I love my wife. And you might say, oh, you're 45 now. It's in the past. It must be almost forgotten. Yeah, not a bit of it. You may say something, I may read something. Oh, whatever, just a fleeting thought, and it's there today in 1982, just as vivid as it was in 1959. You learn to live with it, or exist with it, because it certainly isn't a life. You're burned out inside. And you lose some of your abilities to form emotional relationships whether on a purely platonic basis or whatever, you lose this. And I find myself now at the age of 45. Whilst I can feel compassion for people as a whole and for individuals, uh, that's about the only emotion I can feel. Affection, that's gone, that's dead. In fact, I'm dead. And I'll never be alive again. What is it like living in the hostel here, and have you a job? I have a job. I'm a chef by trade, um, which I learned in prison. I was a railway signalman prior to that. Um, I'm earning a fairly good living. Uh, the hostel, as such, is like a fairly large boarding house. Um, you're left pretty much to your own devices. There is assistance there if you seek it. Um, after serving the, all the years in prison that I have, you tend not to seek advice. It can have terrible repercussions. And by that I mean that uh, if you express any anxiety, the very next thing you know you happen is you're being consulted by a psychiatrist. And that can result in you being taken back inside again. So if you are anxious, you tend to keep it to yourself. And it was for this reason, in point of fact, that I was recalled. Do you think it's a gamble, you talking to us at all? It's a bigger gamble than, than you will ever be aware of. I was first told of the possibility of this interview a couple of weeks ago, and I gave it a great deal of thought. I'm not on an ego trip. All I'm trying to do is to help those men in there serving the time as I've served my time, hoping to cause a little crack in the ice, hoping that the general public will see 
I haven't got two heads. I'm not six foot seven tall. And five foot seven is a point of interest. Very small man. Small in both senses of the word. And all I want to do is for people to see that, all right, we've committed a grave offence. We don't try to hide from that. We've got to pay for that offence. But are we going to release men or order beatings? I've said to you that I can't feel anymore on a deeper level. And that's what the system does. It gets you to conform. Well, who is conforming? What is conforming? I still feel as I felt in 1959. Older. In some ways a bit wiser. But I'm not a person anymore. I've got the shape of a person. But emotionally I'm hollow. There's just nothing there anymore.